the mic's always on. You're on. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, welcome everyone who's here and who is at home uh, uh, watching this service on YouTube or the church uh, website. It is August 1st, 2021, and this is the Seaside Assembly of God Sunday morning service. And we welcome you. I'd like to, to uh, bring a scripture as we begin. Um, you've probably all had friends who have asked, you know, how do we know the truth? How do we find the Lord? Right? And everyone's, everyone's asked that. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Uh, and I'd like to turn to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Um, so there's a lot uh, in here. Um, the gospel didn't come to us in word only. Man likes to just deal in words, right? Every secular university has a religions of the world course, and uh, they read books that PhDs have written about all the great religions, and, and the idea is you read about all the religions and you sort of decide what looks, seems cool to you and what you would like to pursue. Uh, but it's just words, you know, it's just so many words. And uh, that's how a lot of people, people try to find, try to make a, make a decision. But that's not what, what uh, the Lord is telling us here, because it's not just in word only, but also in power, because this, these words are living words. It's not just like all those other millions and trillions of books that have been written about all kinds of stuff out there and fill our libraries. This book alone is God's living word. And then if we come to it with, our, with an open heart, uh, he will teach us and bring us along and bring him to himself. It's also the gospel comes to us in power, it says here. And then it goes on and it says also it comes to us in the Holy Spirit. Um, and this tells us we can't, no one as we know can find the Lord and really come to the Lord without the calling of the Holy Spirit. We don't do it ourselves. And why would that be? Well, I think one reason is because uh, Jeremiah tells us that the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So how would it be if, if we stood before the Lord and, and said, well, thank you, Lord, for, for dying on the cross for me, but... But also, I was kind of smart, and I figured it out that maybe this was the way to go. And so we kind of share, I can boast a little bit too. That would not fly with the Lord, because he is a holy God and pure. And we are, as the, as the, the word is telling us, and is so true, deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked in our hearts until, we, until the Lord gives us a new heart. So even finding the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit has to be involved, and convicts our heart, and comes to us, and we can accept that or reject it. Uh, but it's the Holy Spirit at work that brings that gospel into our heart. And then finally it says, and in much assurance. And you know, we have that great hymn, Blessed Assurance. The Lord, you know, people ask us, well, how do you know? Well, the Lord gives us that assurance in our hearts. And it's a supernatural thing, and it comes along with, with being saved and repenting and, and humbling ourselves before the cross and, and, and having a heart to follow the Lord. And along with that comes that, that blessed assurance where we do know. And maybe I can't, I can't transfer that assurance to someone who's seeking, although we can let our light shine and we can, we can be an example. And some people say, you know, do people say to you, well, something different about you. And in that sense, our assurance kind of leaks out, but still uh, they, will, they will have that assurance once they accept the Lord too. He gives us that assurance that we know that the promises that the Lord has made in this book in this living word, are true, and, and uh, we know the end of the story. And we, it's, it's such a, a, a blessing to not only to serve the Lord, but have that assurance and, and just know that he's walking with us, that everything he has promised uh, will come to pass. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, we just, we just love you, Lord. We thank you that you knew our, our heart, you knew our deceitful heart, and you knew a way, Lord, to save us and to, to redeem us and to give us a new heart if we would, if we would repent and, and believe on your name, believe in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you for that, the Holy Spirit working in our lives. We thank you for that assurance, Lord, uh, of our salvation. And we just uh, offer this prayer, Lord, that, that uh, you would uh, anoint the pastor as he brings the word this morning and, and let everything that happens here today be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a wonderful word. Praise God, praise God. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love. His love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Though the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my father. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am, you are for me, not against me, I am who you say I am, I am who you say I am, who the sun sets free, oh it's free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Our God. 
the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Hallelujah. God reigns. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's the theme of our message today. God reigns. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Those of you who have a bulletin have a, on the inside a copy of our handout notes today. And perhaps those who are with us in the virtual service will find that on our website. That's our standard, just to put those notes up or, so you can follow along. We're on the theme of getting to know God, knowing God. Well, I know God, sure, but I need to know Him better, no matter who we are. For those who have um, filled out a welcome card at a church service, you are a visitor or a newcomer to a church, there's a little welcome card to fill out, and many of them have a little note, such as ours has, a little checkbox, I want to know more about being a Christian. I always check that box. I always check that box. I want to know more about being a Christian. Sure, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for most of my life. I want to know more. I want to know Him better. Knowing God. God reigns. God reigns. Our launch verses are Jude, verse 25, and Revelation 11, 15. Let's read those verses together. Jude, verse 25. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. And then Revelation 11, 15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Lord, you reign. Hallelujah. We rejoice right now, O oh God. We celebrate you. We join with the angels around the throne in celebrating you, Lord. You are ruling and reigning now and forever. We pray, God, that you'll help us once again to recognize the awesome presence of our God with authority over all things, all things in the universe, all things on this planet, all things in our individual lives, Lord. You reign. We ask you, God, to open up that reign upon our lives, O oh God. Every area of our lives that's not fully surrendered are areas where we lack, but where we surrender to you and let you reign. Those are areas of fulfillment in our lives. So we pray, God, that you'll cause this word to be powerful in our hearts today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He shall reign forever and ever. He reigns now and forever. He reigns now. Let's look at the overall, overall context. He reigns forever. It's an unending reign of our Lord and God. Psalm 146, verse 10. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. To all generations. The first generations of this earth to the last generations of this earth. He reigns, he rules, he is sovereign over all. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. He made it all, and he made it all with eternal power. As the generations go by, as the centuries go by, and exploration grows, and our knowledge of, of the universe and our knowledge of, of the microscopic universe as well, we're learning more and more about how vast and how grand and how wonderfully working this universe is. God made it all. He's sovereign over all of it. Amen. And this scripture in Romans chapter 1 says that it's a demonstration of his eternal power and divine nature. He has all power and he uses it well and wisely in his divine nature of who he is. In the news, just this weekend, there's a headline that scientists, some elite scientists, leading scientists, believe that they possibly have put together and, and orchestrated the chemistry to put together a time crystal using um, quantum computers and understanding of quantum physics that they possibly have put together a time crystal. That this is a bit of crystalline material that alters from one state of matter to another back and forth without losing any energy. And one article prefaced this by saying, this could be the greatest scientific discovery of our lifetime. Really? Really? We discovered how to manipulate a crystal. I think the greatest scientific discovery of our lifetime is the universe displays, displays and declares that our God has eternal power and glory. Every generation needs to discover that. And now, I'm not trying to belittle the scientific accomplishment. 
there's a brilliant scientist working with, with um, theoretical physics and quantum mechanics and all that sort of thing. It's far beyond me. I'm not going to split the atom anytime soon myself. Um, but when you compare what the scientists have done with what God has done, there's the theological term for it is meh. <laughs> Who needs it? Sure, you did something phenomenal. But look what God did. Amen. Look what he has done. From the beginning to the end, all of it is God's creation. His eternal power. <clears throat> He's the creator of the universe and beyond. He is God forever. Amen. He is also God reigning now. First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, and the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, Lord. You are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. Lord, in your hands is power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, somebody who's just casual about spiritual things is going to say, well, yeah, this is the Bible. The Bible is going to say nice things about God. But those of us who know him, those of us who are drawn to worshiping him, when we hear these words, isn't your heart just joining in saying, yes, 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 God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the majesty. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Yours, all in heaven and earth is yours. You rule over all. You're exalted as head. You reign. You have power and might. The Lord reigns. Bible teacher D.A. Carson said, when we speak of kingdom today, we often think of a realm rather than a reign. That's on a website, Desiring God, and I go to that from time to time, getting nuggets of, of some inspiration. When we think of God's kingdom, we often think of a realm rather than of a reign. The realm of God is everywhere, but his reign is wherever, his reign is a total, is a total reign, but it's effective where it's accepted. God has given us free will, and this world is in rebellion, isn't it? This world is in need of, of, of God. His realm is everywhere, but his reign is in the hearts of those who respond. And as we respond to God, his kingdom grows and grows. And of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Aren't you glad you're part of the greatest thing of all time? This is God's eternal plan. And his rule and reign over this world is good and it's great. And God gives us free will and allows us certain measure, but also God interrupts our plans. God interrupts the plans of the power makers, the movers and shakers, and God can bring about his will. The word of God says he turns the hearts of kings. God can turn hearts. He's still ruling and reigning. Even in parts of this world and in hearts that are in rebellion against him, God still is sovereign. He still reigns. He still has the authority and the ability to make the difference. There's a poem from the 1840s from Robert Browning. One line says, God is in his heaven, all's right with the world. You probably heard that phrase. God is in his heaven, all's right with the world. Well, all's not right in terms of every individual circumstance of, of what people are doing here on this planet. There's a lot of good going on. There's a lot of evil going on. It's interesting, sometimes you have these, these um, celebrity concerts and features on uh, programs um, and music uh, award shows, and so many, many times the theme is, we're all good, we're all great, we're in this together, and then it's followed by the evening news. There was a shooting, somebody ran over somebody, somebody defrauded somebody, um, somebody got arrested for dealing in this and that, and kind of like, well, okay, we want to have unity, we want to have peace, but guess what? There's over a million people incarcerated for one reason or another, just in this country alone. Um, there's a lot of negativity, a lot of wrongdoing going on. God's realm is the world, his rule is over the hearts of those who respond, and he has the authority to, to lead people and even to turn the hearts of kings to accomplish his work. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's going to get it done. He's going to get it done. So as we see what's going on in our world, we can still say, it's not scripture, but I think it's an interesting quote, that God's in his heaven, so all's right on, in the world. We can look to God. Whatever's going on, whether it's war, famine, disease, um, poverty, whatever's going on on this planet, and disunity, we can say, God, you're up there, and you have the solution. We keep looking to God. God's in heaven, therefore this world has a sovereign who can make the difference. He can change things on this planet as it needs to be. He rules and reigns as our Savior. He reigns over our soul's eternal destiny as Savior. 
He reigns over your soul's eternal destiny. He's the one who holds your future, your present, in his hands. Titus 2, verse 13. We are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Great God and Savior. Jesus Christ is great God and he is Savior. And he can save us. His reign extends to, the, to ruling over your destiny. You're in his hands. As you surrender your, 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 your history to him, surrender your present to him, he'll take a hold of your future and he'll make it his plan in his kingdom. He is the great God. He is our Savior. Second Peter, first chapter, first verse, he writes to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God and Savior, and he is righteous in giving us faith. Do you have faith? I have faith in the Lord. I know that he has redeemed me. I know that he is protecting me. I know that he's working in my life to make me fit for his heaven. I don't know how I can do that, but he's at work doing that by his Holy Spirit. Praise God. Praise God. You can turn to one another and just say, I'll see you in heaven. I'll see you now and I'll see you forever. We'll be buddies for now and forever. Through, you know, it won't be time. Time will be no more. But God will, if we counted it by time, a billion, trillion years from now, you're going to see the same folks rejoicing in the same Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have attained that precious faith. It's a righteous thing that God himself, Jesus Christ, as God and Savior has done. He reigns over our souls. He reigns over our eternal destiny. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Can you say that word all? All. all. Thank you, Lord. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, we were on spiritual death row, every single one of us. We were under condemnation. We had no recourse except the mercy of the great judge of the universe. Amen. But he canceled that charge against us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. The things that condemned you and me, he nailed those things to the cross. Verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The devil thought he won. The devil thought he humiliated the Son of God by putting him on the cross. But you know what? It was the cross where Jesus Christ triumphed. It was his throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord had a breakthrough of victory and triumph over sin, death, and hell by going to the cross and, and by nailing that condemnation of, of, of your life. He nailed that to the cross. And so it wasn't a humiliation for Jesus. It was a victorious celebration. It was a victory, a triumphant occurrence of his um, taking the throne and by taking that, that by reigning upon the throne of, of the cross even, that he could rule and reign our spiritual needs. So he is our savior. As a righteous God, he reigns in our lives by reigning over our soul's eternity, eternal destiny. He is our healer. He's our teacher. He's our guide. He's our friend. Oh, he is our friend, isn't he? Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord is high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. That's part of the righteous reign of God. His reign is so complete that he knows every single one of us and every part of our lives that we say, well, God, you're high and mighty and you're so far above my life. Why would you pay attention to me? But he regards us. He looks upon our lives. Now, that's, that verse goes on to say, but the proud he knows from afar. If we say, Lord, I've got this. I figured it out. You know, I appreciate what Doug started off with and talking about we have to have the spirit open our hearts and draw us to the Lord. Otherwise, we might say, well, I figured this out. You know, if we say, I figured this out, I don't need the Lord. The Lord knows those who are, who are lowly of spirit, but he regards the proud from afar. If somebody figures out, they, they figure they've got the spiritual thing figured out on, on their own, God kind of stands back and says, you know, how's that working out for you down there? You, you need some help down there? And the Lord allows us, all of us prodigals, to get to the point where we have to say, I will arise and go to my father's house. I will go to the spiritual heavenly father and say, Lord, you're the one. You're the one who can fix me. Every path that I've taken on my own leads to disaster. But every path that I let him lead me, 
He rules and reigns as my friend. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one. We know this verse. We hear it from time to time. It's important. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Once again, God is high and holy. He's the ruler of the universe, and yet if our hearts are humble before him, he comes and he revives. God said, I revive your spirit, and I revive your heart. You need a heart revival? I'm not talking about 100 beats per minute. Staying alive, staying alive. Heart revive. Heart, no. Revive your spirit, revive your heart. Well, we need a spiritual revival. Is your spirit weary? Or is your heart discouraged? Or is your heart even broken? God said, I come to revive your spirit. I come to revive your heart. I need a spiritual revival. Every day I need the Lord to revive my spirit, to revive my heart. I need to be encouraged. I need to be led by him. And as I allow him to inhabit eternity and to inhabit the high and holy place, but also to inhabit a humble heart, it's a reminder, the Lord is the friend of those who are humble. He reigns in the lives. If I make my heart his throne, he comes and makes my life beautiful. And he revives my spirit. He revives my heart. And he said, I dwell. He said, I dwell to revive your spirit and your heart. If you're broken, the dwelling is what revives us. His, his, just his presence is all it takes. Just knowing that he's with you is what it takes to know that your spirit can be revived and your heart be revived. Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. That's some powerful thoughts there. How precious are your thoughts toward me, O God. God is thinking about you. And they're good thoughts. They're precious thoughts. Just as something, whatever's precious in your life. Your spouse, your children, your possessions perhaps, your accomplishments perhaps, your job is precious to you. Um, your, your opportunities of service are precious to you. The abilities to do something good in somebody's life, that's a precious thing. But how precious are God's thoughts for us? Think of that, that meaning of that word precious. There are common stones, there are precious gemstones that have a high value. God puts a high value into the thoughts for you. God's thinking some really dramatically good things about your life right now. God wants to redeem our spirits, revive our spirits, revive our hearts, and to redeem us from every trap of the enemy, to make us strong in him. He's got a good plan for your life forever, but a good plan for your life today. His precious thoughts are toward me, it says. And the, some of them, I, I should count them, they'd be more than the number of the sand. God has many, many good thoughts. Now, maybe I can take care of one thought at a time. I'm not all that good at multitasking. But God can multitask, can't he? He's, he's the ace at doing that. He knows all about your life, and he has numerous precious thoughts about you. And he says, when I awake, I am still with you. Now, that's a little twist on the phrase. We might think, Lord, you're still with me. But he says, I'm still with you. The Lord didn't move. He kept us with him all along. What a precious friend he is. Psalm 71, verse 3. Be my strong habitation to which I may resort continually, Lord. Be my habitation, the place where I dwell, the place where I truly live. The place I truly live, Moses said in the psalm, we dwell under the shadow of the Almighty in his presence. We are present in his presence of the Lord. He's my strong habitation. And I resort continually. It's not the last resort. It's the continual resort. Now, we don't go to God as a last resort. Now, there are resorts on this planet. They probably cost you a lot of money to go and spend a few nights and days at a, at a fancy resort. But you know what? You're living continually in a resort. Okay, it's a little twist on the term, but you know what I'm saying. I resort to his presence continually. I'm constantly living in the house of the Lord. I'm so glad that he is my strong habitation and I resort continually to him. Whatever's rising up against your life, Run to Jesus. Run to the Lord and allow him to strengthen you. He is reigning in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Don't you love that verse? He has made it new. He took away the old, the old rags. There's an old spiritual song. I don't wear no old. I don't wear old rags no more. I don't wear old rags no more. He has clothed us in His righteousness, and the filth of the sin of my life He has taken away. He has strengthened and blessed us. So if we're Him in Him, the old is past. All things have become new. I'm new in Him. Once again, if the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Let him know that you're a child of God. Live in that covenant relationship with God. He is reigning in us, making us new. He has made us new. And he's reigning through us. We're part of this. He's called us to be part of what he's doing in this world. Romans 5, verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one, death reigned through the one, much more shall they that receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one, even Jesus Christ. He calls us to reign with him. He's reigning in my life, and by doing so, he's causing my life to be salt and light as a child of the king, as, uh, as a royal heir. I am living this life as a demonstration of what God can do with somebody. And every single one of us, we live a victorious life. As we let him reign in us, he reigns through us, and he shows his kingdom to those around who need to come in as well. So many examples, great and small, of how God has redeemed people. There's one particular storyline that I wanted to bring out, and that's the story of Mary Magdalene. We know her, her story, but she's a dramatic example that old things are passed away, all things have become new. She's a dramatic example of reigning in life because he has redeemed us and we've received abundant grace and righteousness. In Luke chapter 8, it mentions that Mary Magdalene was delivered from seven demons, but became one of a network of women who were supporting Jesus and the disciples, Luke 8 verse 2. In John chapter 19, Mary Magdalene was one of the ones, one of the women who came and stood by the cross and witnessed the crucifixion. In John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene was among the first to see Jesus on resurrection morning. She's a dramatic example that we can learn from her, from being demon-possessed, wild, out of control, and on her way to an eternal future without God. Jesus <coughs> delivered her, and she became a shining example of how we can live our lives, of adoring Jesus no matter what. Even if it led to a, the, that whole ugly scene of a cross, it was a beautiful scene. She knew that her bond with her Lord and Savior was so strong that she could come and she could endure witnessing what was going on. And the Lord sought her out early that resurrection morning and encouraged her as well. She's a prime example, isn't she, of what God can do with one of our lives, any one of our lives. No matter where we came from, we become a shining example of how he rules and reigns. Well, he reigns supreme. Here's some scriptures. And again, for those who look at the Bible as an academic work of, of prose and poetry and history and writings, they expect, expect that the Bible is going to say some nice things about God. But for those who really know him, these words just challenge us to worship right along with them. Some scriptures here. Genesis 14, 19, he is God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Deuteronomy 10, 14, behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's your God, the earth also and all that is therein. Job 41, 11, everything under heaven is mine, says the Lord. God says, I got that, I got that, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. Oh, those people there, those are mine people, my people too. God owns it all. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell therein, even those who have not surrendered to his reign in their life and have not, not come to repentance yet, he, God still owns them. He's still the owner. They're not freed from that ownership status that God has over their lives. Ezekiel 18, verse 4, God says, all souls are mine. Every one of us belong to God. He has that rightful ownership to tell us how to live and how to follow him and how to reverence his name. Romans 14, verse 8 says, we are the Lord's. We are his. Aren't you glad you have a, a loving God rather than, a, than a, a, a tyrant ruling your life? and owning your life. God has mercy, he has grace, he has favor for our lives. 
powerful scriptures. Revelation 15, verses 3 and 4. And this is from the Good News Translation. I like how it phrases it. It brings it afresh again. Lord God Almighty, how great and wonderful are your deeds. King of the nations, how right and true are your ways. Who will not stand in awe of you, Lord? Who will refuse to declare your greatness? You alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you because your just actions are seen by all. That's from Revelation chapter 15. Beautiful words about the present worship of God and the future worship of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, also from the Good News Translation, verses verse 16 through 20, 22. I remember you in my prayers, the apostle says. I ask the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit who will make you wise and reveal God to you. We all pray that. God be revealed by your spirit, in spirit and in truth, so that you will know him. God, I want to know you. Isn't that the cry of our hearts? I ask that your minds may be open to see his light, so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you. How rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people, and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. Hallelujah. Does your heart rejoice when you hear these kind of terms? We need to grow in our knowledge of how very great is his power in working among us. He has all authority. Is he supreme Lord over all things in your life? Amen. Is he supreme Lord in all things in my life? If there's any corner of my life that I've not opened his light to, may the Lord reveal that and show me that anything that is not indwelt by him is darkness and it's negative. I need to allow him to be sovereign in every part of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you are a great and mighty God. Thank you, Lord, that you have come to us by your word and by your spirit to reveal to us that the worship of the majestic God who reigns over all is what our lives are to be all about. So we thank you, Lord, for your victory. We thank you for your grace. We pray, God, once again, anyone hearing these words today whose heart's not right with you, that this would be a moment of surrender right now, to repent of sin and be cleansed because of what Jesus has done on the cross triumphing upon the cross, Lord, of, of taking away the, the writings that were against us and condemned us and nailed them to the cross and triumphed over them. We thank you, Lord, for righteousness that you put in our hearts as we surrender to you and receive your forgiveness and your glory upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.